A very good evening to you and uh, welcome to this Bible study this evening. We are still studying about the believer's inheritance. So far in the last two Bible studies, we have seen what the Bible says about salvation and inheritance. We have seen the differences between the two. And once again, let me uh, repeat this because the best way to learn something is by way of repetition. So it is good for a preacher or a teacher to repeat himself, even though for some it might be a little tedious sometimes, it is good for others. All right, so the difference between salvation and inheritance, without going into the details, is that salvation is a free gift accomplished by what Jesus Christ did on the cross for your sins and mine. When he died for our sins, was buried and rose up again. Inheritance, on the other hand, is not based really on our... Uh, on, on uh, or rather it's not a free gift it is an earned reward we work for it all right so that's the difference salvation is given to you as a free gift by the Lord Jesus Christ by God based on what he has accomplished on the cross whereas inheritance is not so it is something that the believer earns uh, salvation cannot be lost and we have seen the details of this doctrine a little bit. But inheritance can be lost. And that's why a born-again believer has to be careful about his life here on this earth. We have seen that salvation is ours now presently, in this present time. But in the, the, uh, you know, the inheritance that God gives to the born-again Christian is yet future. It will be ours in the future. So it should help you to uh, understand the differences between salvation and inheritance because Christians get confused on this uh, simple doctrine of salvation. They complicate it and they make it look like a born-again Christian can lose his salvation. Now the reason why they believe that is because of various reasons and one of the reasons for that is because they confound inheritance with salvation. Now, once you rightly divide the word of truth, you will see that salvation cannot be lost. It's ours now presently, whereas inheritance can be lost. And inheritance is something that still awaits us in the future. So today we are going to look at this inheritance and see what the Bible says about it. <clears throat> there are two parts to this inheritance. Again, you must understand this difference. If you do not understand the difference here within the inheritance itself, again, there could be scope for confusion. Let me explain myself. Like I've said, there are two parts to this inheritance. The first part of this inheritance cannot be disinherited. Let me explain what I mean by this. There is one part of our inheritance that cannot be disinherited. Let me show you what I mean by this. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will. Now look at this. Look at the past tense in this verse. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. It is already obtained. It is already ours. Now I know that this could get a bit confusing in the light of what we have said about inheritance already. We have said that inheritance is yet future. Right? But I will explain myself. There is one part of our inheritance which is already ours. We have already obtained it. That means it has already become ours. Now this part, as I've said, is already ours. And while I've said that inheritance generally is revocable, that means it can be lost, it can be changed, it can be taken away. This part of our inheritance cannot be taken away from us. Let me show you another verse. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. 
We'll read verses 3 and 4. I'm sure you're familiar with these verses. 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Now look at the words here. Because of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross, because of his death and resurrection for our sins, as a sacrifice for our sins, God has begotten us again unto, unto a lively hope, he says. Unto a lively hope. To an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Look at that. Not only have we already obtained it, but this is further described as incorruptible. Incorruptible. Uh, what's the other one? Undefiled. That fadeth not away. Reserved in heaven. This is reserved in heaven for us. And the verses that, uh, you know, talk about this part of our inheritance make it very clear to us that this part of our inheritance cannot be taken away from us. All right. And I'm going to show you what this part of our inheritance is. The first thing I want you to do is Understand that our inheritance has two parts to it. There is one part which cannot be disinherited. There's another part which can be disinherited. And uh, Ephesians 1.11 and 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4 make it very clear to us that there is an inheritance which, has, which we have already obtained. It's already ours. It's waiting for us in heaven. All right. And uh, it is incorruptible. It is undefiled. It fadeth not away. It's ours, praise God, and it doesn't depend on what we do or what we do not do. And that's a blessing really if you think about it. Now let me show you what this first part of our inheritance is. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, brethren, that the Bible talks very clearly about how we are going to get the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when you talk about the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, you should not get confused because there is a spiritual aspect to the image of God, right? We have the image of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, restored in us already. Okay? The moment we were born again. We are not talking about that. We are talking about the physical image of the Lord Jesus Christ to which we will be conformed one day. It says we have been uh, predestinated to be conformed to the image of His Son. This is talking about a future event when we will be conformed into the image of his son Jesus Christ. The promise is ours. It's as if we already have it, but we just have to wait, right, for that moment when the Lord Jesus Christ shall come down for the church. And that is the moment that, you know, the moment of the rapture, when we will be changed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right now we have the spiritual, we bear the spiritual image of God, which man lost when he sinned, right? Adam, when Adam sinned, he lost the image of God. He lost the image of God. And throughout the Old Testament, people did not have this image of God restored till the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remember, he is the express image of God. 
And once he comes to indwell the believer, that lost image of God is already restored in us. Right now we have a living spirit, a born again spirit. And we are one spirit with the Lord. The Bible says, so that lost image of God has been restored. But you see this, we will be conformed into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And that happens at the rapture. Let me show you a few more verses. Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 23. Romans 8 verse 23. It says, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. What is this talking about? As I've been repeating myself quite often in all our Bible studies, when we were born again by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? When we were born again by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection, what happened to us? As I've said before, we are made up of a spirit, soul and a body, right? The spirit was dead before we came to the Lord Jesus Christ and the spirit now is born again. The soul is saved, but the body, you see, it is yet unredeemed. And that's what this is talking about. There is a time when a body shall be redeemed and that once again is at the rapture of the church. This is where the redemption of the body takes place. Redemption of the body takes place at the rapture of the church. Till then, we live with a dead body. We live with a dead body, a corpse. Now, you see this, that we are redeemed, really. That means our soul is saved, the spirit is born again, our souls have been redeemed. We belong as a whole to God. But this part of us is yet corruptible, right? That's because sin is in this body. And that's why this body is susceptible to death. And when we are conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's when our body is forever redeemed and becomes incorruptible. Incorruptible. So in Romans 8 and uh, verse 23, he says, that we are groaning within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 14. And you, this is a very simple doctrine, which is very easy to understand. All you have to do is believe what the Bible says. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 14. It says, uh, speaking about the Holy Spirit who has sealed us, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Let me read that again. Which is the earnest of our inheritance. Who is the earnest of our inheritance? The Holy Spirit. That means he's the guarantee of our inheritance. What is that inheritance and what is he talking about? Until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So. He is the guarantee, the earnest, that we will get our inheritance, right? And look at the connection there of inheritance with the redemption of the purchased possession. What is this purchased possession that Paul is talking about? We, as a whole, of course, belong to God. We have been purchased by God. So that includes our body. Though it is yet unredeemed, it's a corpse, it is waiting, it's redemption, it still belongs to God. Look at what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll read verses 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verses 19 and 20. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Your body is not your own, it says. 
Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Verse 20, for ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Do you see this? Just because a body is yet unredeemed doesn't mean that it belongs to nobody. It's not like that. Even in this unredeemed condition, the body belongs to God, just as the spirit belongs to God. Now for those who do not believe that uh, the spirit and soul are two different uh, things. Those who believe that the spirit and soul are used interchangeably in the Bible, look at this. The spirit and the body belong to God. They don't belong to us. But the soul is not mentioned there. That's because the soul is us. The spirit and the body are not the possessions of the soul. They are the possessions of God. You must keep that in mind. And this body belongs to God. That's why Paul talks about how we should give our body to God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. He didn't say give yourselves or he didn't say give uh, your life as some people say, give your life as a living sacrifice. It doesn't say that. Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. It says give your bodies a living sacrifice. It is unredeemed. But there is a guarantee that this body will be redeemed. Why am I talking about this? Remember, we are talking about that part of our inheritance which cannot be lost. And what I am trying to get at here is that that part of our inheritance which we will get for sure is a glorified body. A glorified body which we receive at the rapture. A glorified body is what the Bible calls being conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the image of his son that we just read about in the book of Romans. He has predestinated us to be conformed into the image of his son. It's already been decided. Predestinated. God has already decided your destiny as a born-again Christian that you will have the image of his son which is a glorified body what is the image of his son Jesus Christ what do you think do you think God wants you to look like his son before he became a man in his pre-incarnate state no right he wants you to look like him and be like him when he rose up from the dead when the Lord Jesus Christ rose up from the dead. I'm going to show you a couple of verses in connection to that. But just keep this in mind that the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance. He is the guarantee that we will get our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. He is the guarantee that uh, you know the purchased possession will be redeemed. We will be Conformed into the image of his son, we will be given a glorified body. Look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse 21. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 21. It says, Who shall change our vile body, which by the way has been changed in modern versions to say, a uh, weak body or something like that. I think a uh, lowly body or some other mild uh, you know, word has been used. But it says here, he will change our vile body. It is vile because it's a dead body. It's unredeemed in this present condition. But remember, it still belongs to God. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself, according to his glorious body. What is that glorious body? When Jesus Christ rose up from the dead, that's when he rose up with a glorified body. With a glorified body. And that's what he is willing to give us, a glorified body. There are super spiritual Christians who think it is a light or a small thing 
for us to get this glorified body. They think, aha, look at this guy. He's talking about the glorified body as an inheritance that is waiting for us. Yes, I don't know about you, but for me, this is one of the greatest things that I'm looking forward to. To have a body which cannot have sin in it, firstly. There won't be any sin. Can you imagine that? No temptations, no lusts of the flesh, right? No trying to bring the soul into subjection through the flesh. All those wars within will cease. No more temptations, praise God. Then, no more sickness, no more disease, no more death. Why wouldn't I desire this glorified body which God has waiting for me? It's a great thing to have as part of our inheritance. Right? Look at Luke chapter 24 and verse 39. Luke 24 verse 39. The Bible says that he's going to change our wild body and make it like unto his glorious body. Look at how his glorious body was. Luke 24 and verse 39. It says, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. A spirit does not have flesh and bones. It's a literal body, even though it's a glorified body. To look at, it looks just like a human body, but it's a glorified body. And you, you remember what all the Lord Jesus Christ do in his glorious body. Or glorified body. He could in a moment travel to the third heaven and come back. He could pass through walls and enter rooms with closed doors. He could eat food without the necessity of having to eliminate it or digest it, right? All these things, wonderful. A wonderful glorified body awaits us. This is an incorruptible body. An immortal body. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and gives us a lot of details about this glorified body which every born again believer receives at the resurrection or the rapture. When Jesus Christ comes into midair, if you are dead, you will be raised incorruptible, your body. And those who are alive will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And these wild bodies will be changed and be conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Physically, we are talking about a physical transformation. And it's not a light thing. It's not, you know, don't think it's uh, spiritual to think that all your rewards and your inheritance is spiritual. That's what they have taught you to believe. That everything God does with a believer is only spiritual in the sense that they are not tangible. You can't see them. It's all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, seated together with Christ in the heavenlies. All that is true, but there is a, a, a literal side to most of these things. And you get a literal glorified body which has flesh and bones. Right? Jesus Christ could eat food in that glorified body, in that resurrected body. And that's the body we are going to get. And as many Bible teachers believe, I believe too, that every man and woman will bear the physical resemblance of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means, even if it's a born-again Christian who's a woman, she will look like the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps that's why every born-again child of God is called the Son of God, right? It doesn't say sons of God and daughters of God. It doesn't say that in the New Testament. All born-again Christians are sons of God, irrespective of their gender. So that's because probably we are going to all get glorified bodies which look exactly like the body of Jesus Christ. We are going to be conformed into the image of His Son. Now, you'll have all these unbelievers, I would say, you know, we are Bible believers. We believe what the Bible says literally. And those who do not believe the Bible literally are like unbelievers. They don't believe what God has said in this book. Just because it goes against their logic, against their way of thinking, against their, the way they have been educated and taught, they would immediately try to find another meaning to what the Bible says. It says that 
we have been predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. It says that he's going to change our wild body uh, and make it, uh, you know, like unto his glorious body. Right? It's very, very clear. Look at another verse which talks about this. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. We'll read verses 1 and 2. 1 John chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the Father had bestowed upon us, that we should be called, what? The sons of God, not the sons and daughters of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it uh, knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, it's talking about the rapture, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Like the psalmist said, I shall be satisfied when I awaken his likeness. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That means the moment of the rapture, when you look at the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're transformed. You become like him. So that, you know, God has all these sons. Among whom, of course, the preeminent one is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, there is so much that we are going to talk about in probably the next Bible study. I don't know if you're going to have the time to do that today. But there's so much that you're going to learn uh, that probably goes against what has been taught to you. Now, what I want you to do is keep your Bibles open. Read the verses you know, that I'm quoting and reading and see if what I'm saying is right or wrong. If I'm wrong, you can just reject this teaching. It's all right. But if I'm taking the Bible literally and if what I'm saying is right, then you need to think about this. There is a physical aspect to our inheritance and that is a glorified body which is given to us at the moment of rapture. Isn't that something that you look forward to having? A glorified body? And there is a purpose for that. Like again, Christians are super spiritual, you know. And they think only in spiritual terms. Everything is spiritual. Heaven is spiritual. It's a wonder these guys who have such a heavenly and spiritual mindset actually believe that Jesus came in the flesh, died and rose up again. It's such a difficult for them to believe, uh, thing for them to believe. Because everything is spiritual. Everything. Heaven is a spiritual place. Oh, heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. Right? All that kind of stuff. They don't want to see what God has said about all these things in the Bible. They think going to heaven is like you're going to just be there throughout eternity in the third heaven in the presence of God. Sitting down at the feet of God. Maybe with an instrument in your hands, playing, singing praises. Probably you'll be given a pair of wings and you'll be flying around there, floating around there, around the throne, praising God. And all such kinds of unbiblical nonsense. The Bible is very clear about these things. You have been, you'll, you're given a glorified body for many reasons. All right, one of them is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah, by his stripes we are healed, right? That is yet awaiting. It is at this point when the redemption of the body takes place that we are healed forever, right? Remember those uh, in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ to enter eternity, they have to eat the leaves of the tree of life. It is for the healing of the nations. There would be a need for that even then. But for us, we don't have that need. Our bodies are taken care of at the moment of the rapture. We are given a glorified body. And another reason is because, again, like I've said, we are not going to just go and be merged inside God or just be floating around doing spiritual things like singing, praising. Not that. We have work to do in the future with those bodies. 
God did not create mankind simply for this end that ultimately we could all go to heaven and be there around the throne forever and ever and ever. No, he's got a purpose for us even after the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And you can see that in the Bible. All right, so don't be so spiritual that you don't notice the physical aspects, the literal aspects of our blessings and of our inheritance that awaits us. So we are going to be given a glorified body, a body which looks exactly like that of the Lord Jesus Christ when he rose up from the dead. Capable of doing exactly the same things that he was capable of doing when he rose up from the dead. We have a glorified body. We are going to receive a glorified body and we are going to receive it whether we work for it or not in this church age. See that? We have said that in general, inheritance is an earned reward. It is revocable, you can lose it and it will be ours in the future. Well, yes, this part is yet future, no doubt about that. But it is also irrevocable. It cannot be taken away from us, just like our salvation cannot be taken away from us. Praise God. So, again, like I've been saying, when we teach these things, it's not like we are trying to give you a license to sin. Who are we to give you a license to sin? If you think we preachers and teachers have any authority to do so, then you are very stupid. You need to look at the book. Do you think our God, our holy God, would give anybody a license to sin? Like Paul says, should we sin that grace may abound? God forbid, he says. So don't be stupid. Don't be wise in your own conceit saying, oh, if you teach these things and preach these things, you'll be giving a license to a Christian to sin. You're being silly. Nobody is giving any license to anybody. We are teaching the truth and the truth builds up. It sets free. It edifies so that they don't fall into sin. All right. So that's why. It's important to give the truth. So whether you live a holy life or not, whether you are an effective Christian or not, whether you are a backslidden Christian or whatever it may be, this part of your, uh, your inheritance will not be taken away from you. You will receive it at the rapture. Every born again Christian receives this glorified body. Then there is a second part to this inheritance which will not be taken away from us. All right, this is the second thing that I'm going to talk about. The first one is a glorified body. And the second one, please turn to John chapter 14. The Gospel of John chapter 14. And we look at verses 1 to 3. John chapter 14 verses 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place uh, for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Again, in verses like this, many Bible teachers and uh, preachers make a liar out of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, he really didn't mean, you know, that there are literal mansions in heaven. He was just joking or he was just using figurative language. Don't be stupid. Why would he do that? He's telling his simple fisherman disciples this great truth. That in his father's house are many mansions. Do you think they would have sat down together and said, Okay, now let's exegete the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he said that in my father's house are many mansions. Let's go to the original Hebrew, the Aramaic, the Greek and all these things. And let's see what the scholars say and the lexicon say. Don't be stupid. They took his words literally. He said in my father's house are many mansions and I go to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come back and get you when? The rapture. When he comes into midair. He says, I'll come and take you to be with me where I am. So the second part of our inheritance is a mansion. 
It's a mansion. The first one is a glorified body. The second part of our inheritance, which cannot be disinherited, is a mansion for every born-again Christian. All right, again, this may seem very far-fetched to some of you. Some of you critics there would be sitting and thinking, oh, now let's see how he's going to uh, show us that this is going to be possible. I don't have to do anything. I just have to show you the verses in the Bible. God has said these things in his book. I'm only showing them to you. All right. So it's up to you whether you believe what God said or not. Look up these verses that I'm talking about. So here you have in John 14 verses 1 to 3. Jesus said there are many mansions. Not a few. Many. And I'm going to show you how many there could be. And... He's not talking about some spiritual mansion, right? He's not talking about some earthly mansion. He's talking about heaven. And he's saying there are going to be, there are mansions in heaven. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. If this was only a spiritual mansion, I would have told you. If this was, if I was talking only about a figurative mansion, I would have told you. But I'm telling you, there are mansions in my father's house. And that mansion is waiting for you. And that's where I'm going to be, praise God. Again, irrespective of how we live here as born-again Christians, we have a mansion waiting for us. And I'm going to show you a little bit more about that. Uh, look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. All the while you thought all these verses were figurative. You need to get that out of your mind. All right. They have made it look like this book is a religious book full of things that you need to spiritualize, full of things that you need to understand spiritually. You know why? Because they cannot explain these things otherwise. Uh, they feel they would be put to shame before unbelievers and before uh, Critics of the Bible. So they say, oh, no, no, no. All these things have to be taken spiritually. This is a religious book which is giving you a religious message. No, that's wrong. This book is not a religious book. This Bible is a historical book. Primarily a historical book. And it's not there to give you some message. It is there to show you what the words, plural, of the Lord are. Because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So don't go around telling people this is a spiritual book which has spiritual truths. You have to spiritualize everything in order to understand. You don't have to apologize for this book. You don't have the guts to teach this book as it is. Don't. But don't try to make uh, to help this book out. You don't have to. It's a lion. It's the roaring lion of the Reformation. It can take care of itself. All right. So you don't have to give an apology for this book. And try to say, oh, all these things are spiritual things, not literal things. Jesus was only giving an allegory or all that nonsense. Don't do that. Don't ever do that. These are literal truths. All right. These are literal truths. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 22, Hebrews 12, 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Here the writer gives you, without any shadow of a doubt, what he's talking about, right? He's talking about a city. It's called the heavenly Jerusalem. Heavenly Jerusalem. It's called the heavenly Jerusalem because we all know there is an earthly Jerusalem today. Right? It's there in Israel. In the southern part of Israel, you have an earthly Jerusalem. So in contrast to that, he's talking about a heavenly Jerusalem. He didn't say spiritual Jerusalem. He didn't say allegorical Jerusalem. Right? He's talking about a heavenly Jerusalem, a literal place. How do we know it's literal? Because you see it says, this heavenly Jerusalem, just like the earthly Jerusalem, is situated upon 
Mount Sion. And what we have on this earth today is a shadow of the true Jerusalem in heaven. Keep that in mind. And then he says, uh, unto the city of the living God. It's a literal city. This heavenly Jerusalem is a city. Right, like the psalmist says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Right, in that psalm. In the city of our God, on the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation is the joy of the whole earth. Uh, is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. It's a city, the city of the great king. It's on the sides of the north, not north here. Because Jerusalem is not in the north, here in Israel. This north is up there in heaven, true north. It's a heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the great king, on the sides of the north, on Mount Zion. Look at this. It is not only the city of the living God, but there are a company of innumerable angels. You think angels are literal beings or just spiritual uh, creatures which, you know, are, which cannot be touched or seen with your eyes. You think they are like apparitions, like spirits, though they are called spirits in the Bible. They have bodies, right? Literal bodies. And they can touch, they can do things. They could eat food in the Old Testament. So, just like our glorified bodies. So, this is all literal. When Jesus said, I'm going to, there are many mansions in my father's house. He was talking about the heavenly Jerusalem, which is a literal city. On Mount Zion and the sides of the north called the city of the great king. And that mansion is waiting for us. Praise God. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And Paul, look at what Paul calls this place. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 first we'll read verse 2. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth, such an one caught up to the third heaven. There is a third heaven. That means there are also first and second heavens. Verse 4, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to write. This heavenly Jerusalem, which is a city, is also called paradise. Now we don't have the time, but you can go to the book of Revelation and look how this heavenly Jerusalem is indeed called paradise. But I'm going to show you a few verses in the book of Revelation that talk about this mansion or, or this heavenly city where there are mansions waiting for us. Look at Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21 and we'll read verse 2. We'll read verses 1 and 2. Revelation 21 verses 1 and 2. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. So this is in the new heaven and the new earth that God creates at the end of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. Look at that. Heavenly Jerusalem, New Jerusalem. These are the names given to this city. New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. At the end of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, when God, you know, renovates the earth or whatever you call it with fire and creates a new heaven and a new earth, New Jerusalem comes down from heaven, out of heaven from God. Remember what Jesus said, in my father's house there are many mansions. Where do you think those mansions would be? Wouldn't they be in paradise? What do you think? Because that's where we are going to spend eternity. In paradise. The paradise that comes down from heaven. And that's where those mansions would be. Now look at the same chapter, Revelation 21 and verse 9. 
and verses 9 and 10. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Who is the bride, the Lamb's wife? It's the church, right? It's the church. It's made up of every born-again Christian in this church age. In this church age that we are living in. Every born-again Christian in this church age becomes a part of the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10. Look at this. He said, come, I'll show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. You see that another name. Not only is it a heavenly Jerusalem, not only is it new Jerusalem, it is holy Jerusalem. There's another name given to it. And it is called the, the bride of the Lamb. Why is it? Because that's where the bride of the Lamb would dwell forever and ever. So don't you think the mansions would be there? In that city where you and I, the bride of Christ, are going to be? I'm sure about it. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, in the rest of this chapter, we are given a description of this city. And one of the things that you must make note of is this. I won't go in and read all those verses, but I'll just mention some of these uh, uh, you know, things to you for your understanding. The city is said to be uh, four square, that means it's like a square, four square equal on all four sides. And the length is as large as the breadth. Look at this, he measured the city, it is 12,000 furlongs. This city, which is paradise of course, is said to be 12,000 furlongs. All right, so that means, you know, uh, in one mile, there are eight furlongs. One mile is equal to eight furlongs. That's how many furlongs are there in one mile. So if you make a simple calculation, you will see that there are that this city would be 12,000 furlongs, which means 1,500 miles square or 2,414 uh, kilometers. If you calculate in kilometers, 2,414 kilometers. Did you ever think about this? This is not a small town or a small village it's a huge huge city very big and remember that the length the breadth and even the height are the same so it looks like it's a many tiered city so you can imagine how many mansions would fit a conservative estimate will tell you that Let's say if there are about 10 billion born-again Christians, right from the moment the first Christian got saved till the last one is raptured in 2,000 years of church history. Let's say, you know, a conservative uh, estimate of 10 billion Christians. I don't know if there would be 10 billion Christians or not, but I'm just saying. Uh, you know, I said it's a conservative estimate. It's not conservative, but let's say on the higher side. Let's say there are 10 billion Christians. 10 billion Christians can easily get one acre of land each. Did you hear that? One acre of land for each of those 10 billion people. Don't you think you can build a beautiful mansion in that one acre and still have enough place for a lot of other things? That city can accommodate about 10 billion born-again Christians and have one acre of land for each of these born-again Christians and still have land left over in that city for the throne of the Lamb, for the river of life, for the tree of life on either side and for whatever else God is going to have in that city. There will be enough land left over for all those things. 
Do you think it was a joke when Jesus said, In my father's house are many mansions. I'm going there to prepare a place for you and I'm going to come and get you. This mansion is yours. No matter what, you're going to... That's because, you see, you're the bride of the Lamb. And the home of the bride of the Lamb is the heavenly Jerusalem. New Jerusalem, holy Jerusalem. That's where we will be with the Lamb forever and ever. So if you are a born again Christian, you have these two things guaranteed. A glorified body and a mansion in New Jerusalem. You see, all this confusion about Jerusalem will go if you just think about this. In the Old Testament, when the saved of the Old Testament died, they went to a place called paradise under the earth. That's because the Lord Jesus Christ has not yet died, had not yet died and had not yet shed his blood on the cross. Okay. So they were reserved in that place called paradise under the earth called Abraham's bosom. But when Jesus Christ died, was buried and rose up again on the third day, he took captivity captive. That captivity was paradise because the Old Testament saints were, as it were, in captivity, unable to go to heaven. But he took captivity captive and he went up to the third heaven. Now, when a, a, a born again Christian in this church age dies, where do you think he goes? Do you think he'll still go under the earth? His body goes down into the ground, but his soul, along with his spirit, go up to God. The spirit goes to God. Where does the soul go? The soul goes to its home. That's why Paul said, I knew of a person 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, but such a one as was caught up to the third heaven, he was caught up to paradise. We go to paradise in heaven, in the third heaven, which is our home, which is even called our mother. Look at Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Uh, I think it's in... Uh, Let's look at that verse which says that it's our mother. Look at verse 26, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 26. But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. There is a literal city up there in the third heaven, which is 1500 miles in every direction. And even in height, it's 1,500 miles high. All right. So 10 billion uh, is a small number really in comparison to the city. 1,500 miles in all directions. And there you have these mansions waiting for you. And that's where you're going to spend eternity after the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, I want you to understand this. What I'm trying to say is that there is a part of our inheritance which cannot be disinherited by us. Nobody can take it away from us. These are guaranteed to us. These are waiting for us. One is the glorified body. The other is a mansion for every single born again Christian. And these are not trivial things. These are not things which you can take very lightly thinking oh you're so special I don't want any rewards I'm not expecting any rewards from God uh, you know I'm just grateful that I'm saved don't be this uh, you know pseudo spiritual Christian refusing to delight in what God has in store for you God has a glorified body in store for you he has a mansion for you to enjoy and these none can take away from you. And these itself are such wonderful rewards waiting for us in heaven. But that's not all. God has given us scope to earn so many other things there in eternity. Or in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Which I'm going to talk about the Lord willing in the next Bible study. But I just want to ask you this. I want to ask you this question. If you uh, 
as someone who's been watching this Bible study and are not sure that if you should die tonight, you would go to heaven to be with God. Uh, I, will, you know, I would like to ask you, would you like to be sure right now that if you die tonight, you would go and be with the Lord Jesus Christ, be with God forever? It is possible. Right now, wherever you are, you can get saved and get this assurance that if you die, you would go to be with Jesus Christ. Before you get that assurance, you need to understand this. Firstly, that you are a sinner. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You have sinned against God. It's not just the act of sin, but it's the nature of sin that you possess by birth. That has estranged you from God so that you cannot have a relationship with the God who made you. And you must acknowledge this and say, yes, I have this sinful nature inside me because of which I commit these acts of sin. I have sinned against God, right? You have lied. You have committed adultery. Even if it was just in your thoughts, Jesus said, if you look upon a woman and uh, lust after her in your heart, you have already committed adultery with her, right? Covetousness, the Bible says, is idolatry. Even if you have never bowed down to an idol, coveting something that is not yours is equivalent to committing idolatry. So there are all sorts of sins that you and I have committed. The, not just you, but me. We are all sinners in the eyes of God. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And, but you see, you must acknowledge this, that you are indeed a sinner. You have sinned against God. Then you must realize that the Bible says the wages of sin is death. It's not just a physical death. That is also a part of it. You know that you're going to die someday. You're not going to live forever. You're going to grow old no matter how healthy you are today. And one day you're going to die and you will be buried. You know that at the end of your life, all that's waiting for you are hospital beds, right? Diseases and death. A grave is waiting for you. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Because you're a sinner, you will be paid the wages for being a sinner. And that is death. But you see, this is not just limited to physical death where your body will be buried in the earth or burned, whatever it is. The Bible says there is something called a second death. The first death is when you die physically, but there is a second death where your soul and your body will be cast into a lake of fire where you will burn forever and ever and ever. You must realize that. You say, why? It's because you're a sinner. And because God is holy. A holy God demands that a sinner be punished. It's his world, it's his creation, right? He's the judge and because he's absolutely holy without a single sin, he is the judge of all mankind. You say, but your Bible says God is love, so why can't he forgive me? Well, you just think about it. In whichever country you're living in, by law, a crime has to be punished, right? You go to the court, a human judge, would examine the case and then if he finds you guilty he will sentence you to a punishment that is appropriate to the crime that uh, you have committed if humans are so right in their dealings with crime how much more a holy god who is righteous and just and uh, you know holy yes he uh, is love the bible says god is love but he's also holy he's also just he's righteous he cannot simply say, all right, I'll turn the other side. You know, you have committed all these things, but, uh, you know, sins, but it's all right. I'm just going to look the other way. No, it cannot happen. That's why the Bible says the wages of sin is death. You will be punished for your sins. You will be cast into hell, the lake of fire where you will burn forever and ever. But you see, again, though God is just as you, you know, may have thought God is also love and because he loved this world the Bible says he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life 
The Bible says God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him may be saved. So he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who is God manifest in the flesh. He came down, God came down to this world as a man, lived a holy life without committing a single sin, went to the cross and died in place of all mankind. He died in your place. When Jesus Christ hung there upon the cross, the Bible says he, sin, uh, he became sin for us who knew no sin. He became sin for you. In other words, he bore your sins upon himself. He received the punishment, the penalty for your sins, which you should have received when he died upon that cross. He was your substitute, you see, because God loved you. He could have easily just sent all mankind to hell, but he didn't do that. Instead, he gave his son as a sacrifice for the sins of this world so that his son could bear the punishment that this world deserves, that sinners deserve, that you deserve. The Bible says that he shed his blood upon that cross to pay the penalty for your sins, to redeem you, to purchase you back from your sinful condition from your bondage to sin and death and the Bible says he died in your place he was buried and he rose up again on the third day according to the scriptures all for you so that you could be saved from your sins and from the penalty of your sins which is death and hell now what should you do as I've said in the beginning, you must firstly acknowledge that you are a sinner, that you have sinned against God. Secondly, you must come to Jesus Christ by faith. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. If you come and believe what Jesus Christ did for you and say, yes, I believe, that I'm a sinner, but I also believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He bore my uh, sins upon himself. He took my punishment. He died for me. He was buried and rose up again on the third day. If you believe this, you will be saved this very moment. You say, well, I believe Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. No, that's not what the Bible says you need to believe. You need to believe that Jesus died for your sins personally. That's why we say you must trust Jesus Christ as your personal savior, that he has died for your sins. So you believe and say, yes, Lord, I, I believe with all my heart that Jesus died for me personally, for my sins, to bear my guilt upon himself. When you do that, your sins will be forgiven. They would be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. You would be given eternal life. You become a born-again Christian, a child of God, born again into the family of God. And you would have this assurance through the Holy Spirit that if you die, you would go to heaven to be with Jesus Christ forever. And I want to say this to some born-again Christians who are backslidden. You may not have this assurance, but don't think you've lost your salvation. You have lost the assurance of your salvation. All right, But you, as an unsaved person, can trust Jesus Christ and his offer of forgiveness and salvation right now and be delivered from your sins, be delivered from the consequences of your sins. I hope and pray that you will trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior right now. The Lord willing, we will meet again in another Bible study and continue and try to finish this subject of the inheritance of the believer and see what is that part of our inheritance that we have to work for and uh, that part of our inheritance which can be lost if we do not take care. Thank you very much for joining us. The Lord bless you.